So welcome everybody to Voices with Raveki. I'm very pleased uh, to uh, be having a, 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 a virtual meeting, what I'm starting to call a virtual campfire uh, with Thomas Bjorkman. Um, uh, Thomas reached out to me uh, a while back. Uh, he was uh, watching uh, uh, Awakening from the Meeting Crisis and he, he felt, and I think he, 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 he turned out to be very accurate that there was a tremendous amount of consonance between his work and my work. Thomas has written uh, two books that I'm aware of. Maybe he's written more, but these are the two that I've been reading. Uh, this is excellent. And I'm hoping that, uh, and then more recently, um, uh, this, this book. And these books, I think, are really important uh, in thinking about um, some added dimensions uh, to what I've been calling the meaning crisis and also some um, added dimensions of how we can awake from it and respond to it. Um, so, uh, very excited uh, to have Thomas here. So Thomas, uh, uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, John. And thank you for, for having me on your podcast. Thank you very much. So uh, Thomas, what do you, like, uh, obviously uh, you, you, uh, you know, you play an important role within the metamodern movement, metamodernism. I've had a wonderful uh, Voices with Raveki with Layman Pascal and he, he, uh, he, he said some very, uh, really insightful things. I want, maybe we could start with, what's your take on metamodernism? What does that mean to you? And why do you feel it's important to you personally? And why is it important for, you know, in general, given our current situation? Yeah, uh, thank you, John. And th thank you for, for speaking kindly of my my two uh, uh, latest book, uh, The Nordic Secret. I should mention that I've written that one together with my friend and, and the colleague Lena Anderson, uh, Danish philosopher and, uh, and author. Uh, and then I should also mention that actually the first book I wrote, uh, which I think is um, becoming more and more relevant actually, was uh, coming out of uh, the banking world. I've been an investment uh -huh. banker for, for for, for, for many years, and before that I was uh, in mathematics and physics and using then my mathematical and uh, skills and modeling in, in investment banking. So uh, when I left investment banking uh, a bit more than 10 years ago and set up my own foundation in, in Stockholm, the Oak Island Foundation, Ekferet, the first book I wrote uh, is called The Market Myth. Mm. Uh, and it's uh, really my, my experience from the inside in the market as an investment banker for more than 20 years, um, thinking about uh, the strength, the strength of the market, because of course the market is an incredibly uh, strength, strength, strong human invention. Mm -hmm. uh, but we should remember that it is a human invention. It's not a natural phenomenon. Uh, but also... Uh, we have, I think, and I argue in that book, put a little bit too much faith in the market. Mm -hmm. And the market has sort of b become a, a guiding star for uh, all the human activities in, in a way that uh, the market is not just suitable to, to uh, accomplish. Mm -hmm. So as good as the market is in many ways, uh, the market is, cannot help us with a number of things. And I think that is at least here in Scandinavia, becoming very evident now in the COVID crisis, where yeah. we in Scand Scandinavia has sort of uh, privatized most aspects of uh, healthcare and medicine and all of that. And it comes a little bit as a surprise now to the society that uh, the, the market has not really been able to provide those uh, buffers and been able to be long term enough to uh, help us in uh, this crisis. So uh, that was the first book uh, I, I wrote. Uh, and then um, um, you mentioned the, the market myth, which, sorry, you mentioned the Nordic secret, the Nordic which, which is about, yeah, yeah which, is a, which is about the fact that uh, we in the Nordic countries actually had very visionary uh, politicians and intellectuals 100 to 150 years ago mm -hmm. who really saw the connection between personal inner development and our ability to make meaning, I would say, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and societal change. Right. And how, how this insight really helped to lift all the Nordic countries from being the, uh, the poorest, uh, non-democratic, uh, uh, agrarian countries 150 years ago to become, just a few generations later, the happiest, richest, most stable democracies in, uh, in the world. And that was really this focus on, on inner development. So making a long story short there, what uh, we did back then was that we started actually a, a, a huge number of what I sometimes jokingly call retreat centers all over Scandinavia. And we uh, later on uh, made it possible for young adults in their 20s to spend six months uh, at one of these centers with the expressed aim of developing your inner capacities to be able to act as uh, what we today might call conscious co-creators in the creation of, of modernity and, and, and democracy. Mm. So that's, um, that's quite, quite, quite an amazing story and, uh, and, and not that well known. Right, and very relevant and pertinent today. And then in the world that we create, you sort of went through also this historical analysis of sort of a sequence of normativities You know, there was the normativity around religion and God, and then there was a normativity coming out of modernity um, around, you know, science. And then you say that has fallen under critique with postmodernism. And this dovetails with your first book. That has left the market as sort of the de facto default normativity governing everybody. But as for reasons you have already articulated, while it does a lot of things, it can't do everything. And we we shouldn't deify it. We shouldn't let it be that kind of absolute... Uh, normativity for us. So this takes me back to, so like, um, what, um, what, what, what do you see uh, at, now that we're coming out of, uh, uh, like the, or, or trying to get beyond the postmodern critique, and we're trying to get to a place where we realize um, sources of normativity other than the market. And one of the things you point out in the Nordic Secret was exactly that network Right, that, that, that you know, there was, it, was, it was a cultural project, uh, uh, that network of uh, retreat centers, almost like secular monasteries, where people were going in order to, you know, both individually and collectively engage in kind of, you know, profound transformation and cultivate what I would call wisdom, uh, you know, uh, yeah. an ability to uh, get a reflective awareness of their own self-deception, in, in, inculcate rationality, uh, enhance the capacity for meaning making. So what, I, what I'm trying to now ask, to put it sort of in a bring it brought to a point, uh, Thomas, is how does all of this excellent work that you've done, and you were, I was, you know, I, I got the term from you, you know, the meta crisis, which now people are now using uh, about COVID, which I think you, you deserve a little bit more uh, credit for the idea of the meta crisis about a systemic interweaving of crises. And what, one of the things COVID is doing is disclosing that this, the, 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 the systematic meta crisis. So, what does all of this? What's the connection between all of this beautiful analysis and, well, I'll use your term, you know, the meta crisis? How do we how do we take the what you what you've given us and how do we apply it uh, to uh, the meta crisis? Is, is that a fair question? Oh, yeah, and, uh, uh, absolutely. And I mean, that, that's really uh, how my thinking and writing has been has been going. It has really been a starting point of from analyzing the market and looking at the market as a, as a phenomenon, as a human-made phenomenon that has almost been uh, deified. At least we, we have deferred a lot of normative power to the market that the market sh- does not uh, have uh, uh, at all, really. So that, that brought me into thinking about how we socially construct this world. Mm-hmm. And uh, the starting point of the world we create is really, as you say, it's a historical description of how we as humans develop this unique capacity for humans to construct a symbolic universe. Yes. Through, yeah. our, through our language. Yeah. We, we, we cannot... Some animals can, can use what you could call an index language, mm-hmm. which means that they could have one sound for one type of enemy approaching and another sound indicating another natural phenomenon. 
But what is unique with the human symbolic language is that we can abstract from that concrete level and, and have concepts that has really no correspondence to the physical reality. Mm-hmm. So for example, a stone or a tree, of course, has a correspondence in the physical reality, but there is no correspondence for justice, beauty, democracy, man, money, uh, corporations, nation states, or all of these things uh, are in fact uh, a result from our human ability to construct a symbolic language. And with the help of this symbolic language, we can start creating a symbolic universe mm-hmm. or a what some sociologists would, would call um, a social imaginary or even better, a collective imaginary. Yeah. yeah. Something that comes from our imagination, but we share it co- um, collectively. And this is a unique human ability. And it, it's easier to see this collective imaginary if we look at other societies than ourselves, if we look at, at uh, a pre-modern society or even an uh, indigenous society, th- then we could see this collective imaginary, how you can be- start believing in concepts like uh, spirits and totem and deities. And, and we can a bit, a bit look down on that and think that that is naive and so on. But my point is really, that this collective imaginary is something that is evolving throughout human history. Mm -hmm. And very often it's evolving more or less linearly. But at some points in human history, we outgrow our collective imaginary. And then we have a huge transformation Mm -hmm. of our whole social world. And I think, and that's why I think that the the meta crisis is, is a useful concept because now we realize that all these different crises that we see today like the environmental crisis political crisis or or um, psychological crisis that they cannot be addressed individually Mm -hmm. because the crisis is on such a fundamental level Mm -hmm. that it is really in our collective imaginary and that the collective imaginary that we are living under today uh, which we got essentially from uh, from the Enlightenment uh, transition when we w- went from a dogmatic religious way of looking uh, at the world to a rationalistic scientific way of looking at the world and and this worldview this collective imaginary has of course been extremely powerful and useful for humanity because it has given us modern medicine and human rights and democracy and, and all of that that we would never want to be without. But then at the same time, I believe that we have now used the, the, the capacity, the, and we've, we've reached the end of the capacity of this both worldview and collective imaginary, and that we are at this transition point in our social global system. And from physics, I I have got this uh, model of self-organizing complex systems and thinking in systems theory and thinking in self-organizing systems. I think that is so useful to do that. And that that is something that is applicable, of course, not just to natural science phenomena, but also to uh, your field of cognition. Yes, to, yeah, to, yeah, see, yeah. To, to see the mind uh, not as some sort of a, a machine made out of neurons, but much more like a self-organizing yeah, dynamic, system. dynamic system yeah, yeah. that has the pos- potential for evolution and evolving throughout our lives. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and if you look at culture in the same way, you look at culture as a self-organizing complex system, then you realize that this can evolve, but then also that you come to one of these, eventually come to one of these uh, transition points, phase shifts points or bifurcation points where the system needs a radical transformation that usually entails either 
a breakdown in complexity or a breakthrough to a more uh, complex, more elegant way of, of organizing. And I think that's, that's where we are right now, right. humanity. We are at one of these bifurcation points, and now it's either breakthrough or, or breakdown. Wow, so that's excellent. Thank you. Uh, there's two, two things came up for me when you said that. Uh, what, what, so you, you invoked a deep analogy between uh, cultural uh, culture as a dynamic system and cognition. And I was thinking about, you know, uh, one of the phenomena I study is uh, insight. Uh, you know, you're, you've been framing things in a particular way, and your frame tells you what's salient or relevant, and then you get to a point where that framing is actually thwarting you from solving yeah. the problem. And then you have to go through like this self-organizing criticality. You know, the, the system has to destabilize; it has to become critical. Oh, sorry, they're doing some sort of <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. Out there. Uh, the, the system has to become, you know, critical. It, it breaks down. Entropy increases for a while. You get you get that phase of criticality, and as you say, criticality. Criticality can either mean that the system collapses, and as you said, goes to a low state, or what happens in insight is, right, the criticality breaks the structure up enough so that a new structure becomes possible. And that's you get the aha experience. Yeah. And of course, if you do this on a real large scale with your mind, that, that's when you have this sort of inner transformation or yes. you have a, yes. a, meta, a metanoia. Yes, exactly. exactly. And, as, and as with all self-organizing complex system in in these transitions you have the possibility of emergence yes yes something com something completely new emerges yeah. that yet you could not really predict nor explain in the previous state of uh, of the complex system and and that really for me as a physicist that really made me understand that uh, personal inner transformation, a metanoia, is actually possible. I mean, be, before before that, I thought that this was some sort of religious <laughs> nonsense, you know, a new age spirituality. But but now I can see how this uh, is actually the, the probably the 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 most straightforward way for nature to organize uh, consciousness. It mm -hmm. is it is. Uh, to, to provide um, a general function that would then take in and process information and energy and then use that to self-organize and then to, to transform. That, that would be the natural way for nature to, uh, in a very efficient way, uh, achieve, achieve consciousness. That, that's amazing. Well, you know, you know Thomas, but I'm deeply confident with all of this work, um, mm. uh, and that's what I was exactly trying to propose with the uh, with the met, with the analogy to insight. Because what happens in insight is that you get a new function. That's what the aha is. You get the emergence of a new understanding, the emergence of new options. And so the idea that the uh, the, the culture might be on, uh, at that point. Um, and and also you uh, you were putting your finger on. I'm working on a book with Daniel Craig called The Cognitive Continuum. You know, from insight all the way up to you know enlightenment. How uh, the same machinery, you can see the same machinery at different scales of analysis and complexity when we look at cognition. So there's, a, there's the same machinery that's happening in the aha moment. As you said, it, it's systematic and more comprehensive, but that's what's ultimately happening when people are going through metanoia, the deeply transformative experiences. So, I mean, yes, I, I agree with yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And now if we then um, talk about uh, society and, and our collective imaginary, I, I think that we now, are at the point again of criticality where we need to have such a transformation, such a collective uh, metanoia yeah. uh, uh, again. And we should remember, and I spend the first part of my book, The World We Create, in, in showing that humanity has, or different cultures, has gone through these yeah. sorts of yeah. processes yeah. many, many times. Yeah. When we sort of went from, going back to your original question, when we went from sort of an indigenous uh, tribal society, a hunter-gatherer society into a pre-modern yeah. civilization, and then from the pre-modern civilization into modernity. Yeah. And now we are through post-modernity transitioning into something beyond post-modernity that we might call meta-modernity or whatever we, we would like to, uh, to call that. And, it, and then, of course, it becomes important to, to ask ourselves this question, what, what is it then, this system 
that that is about to transform mm -hmm. what is this collective imaginary and how does the transformation of this collective imaginary relate to our individual transformations and consciousness and and ability to hold and replicate this collective imaginary and uh, the first thing of course that that is makes this so very difficult is that we do not really today outside academic circles of of anthropologists and sociologists we don't have a, a everyday language for this collective imaginary i mean for 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 all of us this collective imaginary is like the water for for the fish yes yes it, it's it, right. it's something we swim in yeah. and we take it for granted but we don't really think about it right but of course um, what's different from from the fish in the water is that for for the fish the water is a natural phenomenon that it's not aware of whereas for us this collective imaginary uh, is not a natural phenomenon mm -hmm. it is a human made phenomenon mm -hmm. but mostly uh, uh, made out of our unconscious uh, reproduction and slow evolution of uh, what we inherit from uh, previous uh, generations you mean cultural uh, you mean culturally, hmm? the, the, the yeah, culture, yeah, exactly. I mean, culture is part of this collective uh, imaginary. So is our worldview. Everything, uh, the market, is a very important part of our collective imaginary. Yeah. Previous collective imaginaries. Then, of course, God and religion yep. took up a l large part of that collective imaginary. Yeah. And, and what is interesting with these collective imaginaries is that we as humans have got this tremendous collective freedom to come up with almost any collective uh, Im imaginary we, we could think of. And if going back in history, of course, I mean, uh, going back just a thousand years, going, going back a couple of thousand years, there were literally thousands or tens of thousands independent cultures that yeah. were living in their completely own collective imaginary. Yes. And, and then through a bit of Darwinistic competition between various collective imaginaries, some proved stronger yeah. and survived. Like, for example, Judaism has been able to survive as a collective imaginary for, 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 for such a long time, whereas other competing collective imaginaries from 3,000 years ago uh, has, has gone uh, extinct. So, th so that is amazing that we have this freedom to create all of this, but that also creates a problem because we need for a, for a society to function, we need to live in the same, roughly the same collective imaginary for us even to be able to coordinate, uh, yep. communicate and direct the actions of the, of the collective. So how do we sort of fix this collective imaginary? Mm -hmm. and, and then sociologists have come up, and this is one of the important postmodern insights, is both the existence and the importance of these socially constructed uh, realities and the narratives involved and the meta-narratives involved in these structures to realize that these are really human constructions. Mm -hmm. But at the same time that we construct these realities, these imaginaries, we also have to fix them somewhere. And that is what the uh, sociologist sometimes calls the ultimate authority yes, yes. in that collective uh, imaginary. And of course, in the pre-modern world, that ultimate authority was usually God. Mm -hmm. So not just having a random world, no, no. You, have, you had the ultimate explanation, why is the world in this way? Right. It is because God has created it in this way. Why should we believe in these Ten Commandments? It's not just that Moses gave us and he thought they were good. No, they need to be absolute if we should fix the collective imaginary. So we need to say they are given by God. And then when we stop believing in God as an ultimate authority during the Enlightenment and we got this, this um, rationalistic scientific, scientific worldview, then um, science took a bit the role in our society as this ultimate authority. 
we, we were looking for the scientific explanation and the scientific answer. But then, of course, with postmodernity, we, we start to realize that even science is in some important ways a social construct and that science do not have every answer. Mm -hmm. So what happens then? And then, of course, interestingly enough, postmodernity does not come up with its own ultimate authority. And then, as you pointed out earlier, I, I argue in my book that the fact that in the postmodern worldview, where we realize the, that all these collective imaginaries and narratives are human constructs, then our social imaginary becomes completely uh, not anchored any longer. And we need, to find, yeah, we need to find some sort of anchor point. Yeah. And that's where the market comes in. And of course, the postmodern philosophers are very critical to, towards the market, but somehow the market slips in the, the back door as a default because there is no other ultimate authority. So then today, it's natural uh, when we ask, why is the world the way it is? Why is it that uh, uh, an investment banker earns... Uh, five or 10 times the, the salary of a university professor. <laughs> well, it's the market. The market, right. The market, the market has the answer. Yeah. So, yeah. What should we produce? Well, the market will, 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 will tell you that. And then we started to um, put a lot of authority into the market. And again, a little bit too much. And, and we are now starting to, to realize that. So, so then, of course, the, the question becomes then, so if we had this pre-modern world with its collective imaginary and with God as uh, the ultimate authority, then we had the uh, modern world uh, with science as the ultimate authority. Now a post-modern transition where the market has taken up too much power and now we're starting to realize that. What will be the next step? Mm -hmm. What will come out of this? What sort of worldview, what sort of social imaginary, and, and what sort of ultimate authority will, uh, will emerge here? And uh, I wish I could have had an answer on that. In my book. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have an answer on that book. But uh, um, you, you can only speculate. But, yeah. but just realizing that we are on this evolutionary path and that we are at this very, very critical uh, uh, point in history Be, because the, the previous times where we have had civilizations collapsing and collective imaginaries collapsing there has always been uh, other competing mm -hmm. um, contenders that have been sort of then given the space to rise up and take the power of, 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 of a civilization but now we are really interconnected in one global civilization and that again from the virus right now that becomes evident yeah. to everyone that that, that we, we only have one world and we more or less only have one collective imaginary as well now and if that one is falling apart uh, i would argue that then we cannot just trust natural selection and uh, the, the random walk we actually need to to make a conscious uh, step into something new and that will be a collective leap a little bit a collective leap of faith into something that we do not know what it is right. but we, we we need to uh, dare to let go and, and and collectively take the leap <laughs> right right well this wow that was uh, that was really that was a fantastic synoptic integration of your argument thomas thank you for that will you laid that out. A couple things came to mind, um, um, with, you know, especially when you were, you know, when you were invoking metanoia within a collective imaginary and how we are understanding how it's deeply interwoven with, you know, you know, intrapersonal and intrapersonal transformation. And, and, um, and so um, I'll use a term that I'm unhappy with, but we don't have an alternative one right now. There seems to be an important spiritual dimension to everything we're talking about. And we even yeah. said that even things that seem so bottom line, like the market, have a lot of, have an almost numinous, like deity aspect to them. And people serve the market and the market yeah. justifies the way the world is. And so uh, it seems to me that part of 
what we are, are talking about then is, uh, well, at least uh, I'll make a point that I've been arguing for, it, it, is that, um, and I know you're not claiming this, you're not claiming we can unlearn everything that these previous revolutions have given us, and we can't sort of go back like to an indigenous world, we can't go back uh, to an axial world, right? So, and, and, and similarly, we can't unlearn science. So it sounds like part of the project has to be uh, to overcome some of the, the divides that were so fundamental to the grammar of the, of the collective imaginary that were falling down, that, that's falling down. Like the divides between science and spirituality, the divides between mind and body, the divides between, you know, you know, subjectivity and objectivity, the divides between, you know, my own personal space and, and, and my own personal cognition and, and distributed cognition. And what I see is, um, one of the differences I see is postmodernism called those questions, called those divides into question. But what I see a lot of people doing, your work, my work, the people I'm talking with and travel with, is we're trying to go from, oh yes, yes, those divisions don't work, but simply criticizing them is insufficient. What we have to do is actually, what does it look like to go beyond those divides? What does it look yeah, like yeah. to try and stitch back science yeah. and spirituality, to try to mm -hmm. stitch back you know, uh, the, you know, the mind and the body and, and the mm -hmm. person and the world? Mm -hmm. And so, although I don't have an answer either, I think that there is a, that there is a both and situation. Yes, yes. Uh, here, here again, we, 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 need, we need to go beyond the divides, but then also the divides can some sometimes be 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 helpful. And what we definitely need to do is that, that in the postmodern insights that that all of these things are just human construct. We we tend uh, t tend to mix everything and put everything on the same footing and just say that okay. things like every perspective is equally valid in every situation and things like that and 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 that is of course not the case so for for example if we if we look at our world uh, today so today for me as an individual uh, i am equally dependent on air to breathe on oxygen and on money to survive in today's society, I need to have oxygen and I need to have money. But we also need to understand that they are fundamentally two different kinds of things. They are ontologically different. Be, be, even if I, as an individual, for me as an individual, I am totally dependent on oxygen and on money. We as a collective, even if every person on earth came together and we decided that we do not want as humans to be dependent on oxygen. We can't do it. We, we can't do it. Yeah, yeah. We can't do it. Yeah. But if we came together, everyone on, on, on the earth or even just everyone in a, a nation state and said, we don't want to be depending on money any longer. We want to invent some new mechanism to allocate the goods in society. Yeah. Money would be gone tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, there is a fundamental difference between, between a, a natural phenomenon like oxygen and a socially constructed thing as money. But what is sad here and, and is that in many cases, we, we mix this up. Yes. So sort of... We also invert them sometimes. Yeah, we, we, we tend to believe that, that the planetary boundaries is something that is up for negotiation. Yes, yes. <laughs> Whereas the market forces, we just need to obey. Right, right. Well, of course, it's completely different. I mean, the, the planetary boundaries will always be there, whereas the market forces is actually under our collective um, agency. We, we can change them, but we need to do that on a, on a collective uh, uh, level. So, uh, so yes, in one way, <laughs> the yeah. distinctions are important, but then on another way, of course, every distinction is just an, an, some sort of arbitrary perspective of the world because at the end of the day, as, as you point out, there is only one interconnected system. It's just one system. But it's very, very difficult to comprehend and take decisions if 
you need to keep the whole of the universe from Big Bang until the end of the universe in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, of course, it's a, very, it's a strong tool we have in, for example, science and physics to understand that if we are looking at the stone falling to the ground, we don't actually, to understand that particular aspect, need to take everything in the universe into account. There are no gods interfering in that. The stone does not have a will. It's a very simple equation. And of course, that is strong. So sometimes it's very, it's, it's very powerful and very strong to have this analytical ability to divide this complex world into small, small pieces. But then, in other cases, it's uh, devastating. And we, need, and we need to see it all as a, as a, a one system interacting and that that system also includes the for example the uh, of subjective yeah. experiences of our consciousness so in this totality of the world there is there are those natural ob natural objects there is our subjective experiences that has got real impact on our action and therefore impact on the world but then also the comp the collective subjectivity that we have put into the collective imaginary and re reified in, into some sort of uh, social uh, reality that meets us as individuals, as almost as objective reality as, as the stone or the, the water. Well, that, that, uh, thank you for that. That, that was sort of lead where uh, the point I was trying to lead to um, is that, and I like the way you put it, the both and, like so, the the critique of all of these uh, of all of these polarities, of course, is important for destabilizing, uh, introducing the criticality. Uh, but I agree with you that simply letting the complexity fall away is not what we want the criticality to give us. Um, so what what's what what I what I hear you saying is, you know, there's there's these there's there's a you know there's a scientific aspect. Uh, there's a like I said this broadly spiritual aspect. Part of what I'm understanding, uh, what, I'm, what I'm proposing to you is part of the meta-modern understanding of spirituality is a recognition and reappropriation of our agency within the collective imaginary and turning that towards the project of facilitating yes. wisdom yes. and yes. Yes. And, then, and, and then, and but then, what you're now saying, in addition to that, is we have to we have to take great ontological care in how we're trying to do the, the, the both end, you know, when we're trying to get beyond. We don't want to simply remove um, the distinctions that are actually necessary for, uh, for you know, appropriately engaging in the reappropriation. We don't want no. to conflate uh, the spiritual with the scientific. So that's, that's, part, of, that's part of what I'm trying yeah, to say. So, 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 yeah. so, I think, yeah, so, so I think that in, in, in in postmodernity, we we have this sort sort of relativistic perspective yeah. that that every perspective is equally valid. I think the next step is some sort of uh, integrated perspectivism, sa saying that for any problem, the more angles, the more perspectives you can view this this situation from, the more information you will get out. But it's very important to discern the, uh, how, how important the different angles yeah, yeah, are yeah. in yeah. Un analyzing a, a, certain, uh, a certain phenomena. So it's not that, the, yeah, you, you need as many perspectives as possible, but then it's a little bit more complicated than just flow, throwing them all in, in uh, uh, in, in a bucket and picking one randomly. No, you, you need to understand what sort of in, information each uh, perspective is best at, uh, yeah. best at providing. So one of the things that I've been trying to use as a model, I don't claim it's an exhaustive model, but uh, is the practice of synoptic integration in cognitive science, where you have the different perspectives given to you by the different disciplines, the entities they look at, the language they use, the type of methods they use, and you're not trying to reduce them all to one homogenous thing. You're not trying to reduce psychology no. to neuroscience, right? But what you're trying to do is afford 
a you know a conceptual a conceptual vocabulary and a theoretical grammar so that instead of them right right I'm not trying to reduce them all to one perspective and I'm not just saying oh well they have nothing to do with each other I'm trying to afford a synoptic integration so that they can talk to each other mutually inform and mutually transform each other so that you get the they they right that's how at least I'm trying to understand how we can steer between you know trying to get a mono perspective or just saying well all the perspectives uh, they they're all incommensurable they don't have anything to do with each other they're all equally good which is this fundamental presupposition behind relativism right is that yeah. they're, they're actually atomically isolated from each other i think yeah. both the, i think both the mono perspective and the atomically isolated uh, idea i think those are both false uh, yes for yes. arguable reasons and so trying to get try to as you say you know uh you know when you're trying to do synoptic integration you're trying to remember the differences uh, because they're important uh, because you know neuroscience can do things that psychology just can't do and vice versa but they also need to talk to each other they need to yeah. be able to transform and inform each other and so that's the model i'm trying to get at you know what how we try to go forward we try to take that that, that skill set of bridging so we can get you know this dynamic convergence between perspective and see if we can scale that up to the hmm. more comprehensive perspectives that are in our culture right now. That's, that's, that's how I'm trying to afford a way of responding for people. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And, and as, as, as many writers have, have pointed out, so far in, in history, when we have gone from one collective imaginary or one paradigm of, of uh, worldview to the next one, we have usually um, completely disregarded the, the yeah. previous yeah, yeah. worldview, and we have even uh, developed allergy against it. It's a yeah, bit like yeah. Yeah. it's a bit like also when we as humans grow. I mean, the the, t the teenager do, does not at all want to recognize the child he right. or she was uh, three years ago. Right, right, right. Uh, but as a really mature person, you should be able to integrate. Yes. your experiences yeah. throughout life w w without yeah. these reactions so so when we went from an uh, from a tribal society into a, a pre-modern uh, monotheistic religious society everything tribal was barbarian mm -hmm. and and was sort of pushed away and when we went during the enlightenment into the uh, uh, rational scientific worldview, everything from religion and spirituality yeah. was thrown out and again with a postmodern way of thinking yeah. Then we are throwing out uh, science and, and, and everything. Yeah. So what we need to do now as a starting point, at least, of course, as many have pointed out, is that we need to try to integrate uh, the, the insights, the very oh. strong insights of all these different ways or modalities or perspectives of viewing the human life and society and, and situation without bringing in the, the limitations. Yeah. and try to get some sort of integral, and that's of course where integral comes from, an integral perspective yeah. on, uh, on the world. But I don't think it's just that. Then, no, we, no. Also have, then, then we also have this emergent yeah. phenomena yeah. that yeah. we don't really know where, what, what, what it is. So it will, just, it will not just be an integration of this, a sum of no, this. No, 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 that, no. That, 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 that will be something uh, more elegant emerging out of this yeah. as well. I think it'll be a complexification. The, thing, the difference between you know, just an integration and a complexification, when systems complexify, they simultaneously integrate and differentiate. And yeah. when the system complexifies, that's when you get emergent functions. And yeah. I, think, I think trying to afford complexification within the synoptic integration is, is a way of trying to uh, not cause, but try to afford that emergence, you know, make, make, make a space for it in our individual. Yeah, yeah. And, and, that, and there is where I think that the connection between um, uh, our personal inner growth and development, the yeah. complexification of our cognitive system yeah. or our total sort of inner system, the complexification of our total inner system plays an important role in facilitating the transition, the breakthrough to uh, a new, more complex, and perhaps also more elegant uh, uh, way of organizing our society, a more complex and elegant yeah. way. Be because in, 
in any any of these different states of the evolution of human human society um, there needs to be a possibility for enough many people in the population to actively engage yeah, yeah. with the culture and with the collective imaginary. Otherwise, it would just be a dead, uh, uh, dead book or something. Yeah, yeah. You need to have, so you need to have some, and I don't know where, where this, you need to have five or 10% at least in the population that are really on a cognitive and emotional level of complexity. Mm -hmm. to really understand and engage and actively, not, not just uh, uh, passively reproduce, but actively be able to reproduce and develop this. So uh, I, I think that the most important thing that we could actually do to help this emergence of a new, more uh, complex civilization uh, is to again just like we did in Scandinavia and the Nordic right. secret uh, right. the, the Nordic secret is to help a, a critical number of of people to uh, mature enough to be able to uh, uh, participate in uh, actively participate as co creators as enlightened as conscious co creators of this new um, society, this new co collective uh, imaginary. And again, just like with the, with the Nordic society, this, the, the amount of people necessary, I think is dependent on um, their distribution in society. And the beauty with the Nordic secret was that these 10% of each generation that were able to participate in these uh, personal development um, activities, retreats, they were actually um, from all sorts of um, social backgrounds. Mm. So they were middle class, but also a lot of working class and from the farming part of population. So you ended up with 10% fairly evenly distributed in society. And I think that, that has much, much larger possibility to succeed than even having 20% in some sort of uh, isolated yeah, uh, elite yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of society. So, so that's where we are, again, helping enough many people to uh, develop the inner capacities yeah. to become conscious co-creators of the next level of uh, society. And, and the point of the, the Nordic Secret was exactly the point that this isn't some idealistic fantasy this is a historical reality this actually happened and yeah 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 I, I usually say that i don't i don't see uh, the the nordic secret the nordic experience uh, as a blueprint for what we should do today we could certainly do this in other ways we might not have to create these rich small retreat centers out in nature even if i believe strongly in that concept and that is what we are doing at the oak island foundation uh, uh, but we, it could be done in different, in different ways today. And, and I'm, for example, involved in a digital platform yep. to facilitate uh, personal development called 29k.org. Yep. So I think that we might be able to, do, to use digital tools to help facilitate this. So it's not a blueprint, but it is certainly a case study yes. showing that this is not a fantasy. Yep. This has actually worked. Yeah. And, it worked, and it worked differently, but it worked well in both Denmark and Norway and Sweden. And that was three different implementations and fairly independent implementation, but about the same time. And it worked beautifully in all three uh, very, countries. Very. And, we, and we still see, even though we've forgotten about this, and yeah. even if we are starting to lose it, I'm the first one to say that as well, that we are starting to lose it in, in, in the Scandinavian countries. We still see the effect of uh, this effort. I, said, I, just, I think that's a really important argument you just made about right, how effective it was, how it was not just one culture, but three different countries. Um, I, I think these are all important points. 
It's, all, it's, almost, it's almost like, like a, a scientific study, you know, full-scale yeah. scientific study. Exactly. Exactly. In, in, in three different societies, a bit different implementation, and then measure this over 50, 100 years and see what happens. And you can see that it worked. Yeah. Of, course right. now, of course now, this was going from a pre-modern society yes. into a modern society. Yes. Yes. Now we're going from a modern or post-modern society into... Some, something new. Yeah. So then this becomes even more important, but yeah. perhaps also more challenging yeah. for us as individuals because this becomes more and more complex and you need to be able to hold more and more perspectives and emotions and we are going from a monocultural society into a multicultural society and yeah. that complexifies things a lot. Yes. So this becomes even more important now. Yes, I think there's going to have to be emerging, uh, you know, emerging new psychotechnologies, new uh, emerging ecologies of practices. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's important what you just said that you're not proposing this as some rigid template that we just transposed from the past and now. You're taking it as like as a a really, as you said, you know, a, a really powerfully. Um, comprehensive historical case study that tells us that something like this is possible. And that's an alternative to a kind of utopianism. You're not, oh, here's my vision of the future. And I can guarantee that if you just do X, Y, and Z, right, if we just do this or that, right, that totalitarian, uh, you're not doing that at all. You're saying, no, no, no. I, I, I'm saying, we're, we're going through a change. Here's something deeply analogous. Let's try and make the analogy as best we can to where we are right now. I think that's a very important alternative <laughs> to both a nostalgia that says, no, let's go back somehow. Let's get back to the yeah. religious world, and, right? Or no, no, a utopianism that says, I know for sure what the future looks like and denies <laughs> the importance of emerging. Yeah, yeah. And, and, that, and, that, and that is also, of course, um, um, why, why this transition is, is in many ways more, more difficult than the previous one from pre-modernity in, into modernity. Uh, and it's not just that we have this sort of emergence, the emergent phenomena that we need to leave, leave space for. Uh, it's not um, just that we have the technological rapid, rapid evolution that we do not really uh, know what Society, what the technological possibilities will be in just 10 years. Right, right. Uh, and, and I think that the future arrangement of, of society and especially the next implementation of the market and of democracy, I think that that will be very much dependent on development in, in for example, blockchain technology and, and other things. So exactly what this will be, we will truly be uh, emergent. But there's one more thing that complicates things and and that is that a hundred years ago it was actually possible at least plausible to argue for a utopia yeah. saying that that this is where uh, we want to be in 20 years or in 50 or in 50 years let's go there yeah, yeah. and it's it's easier to to uh, bring up support for an idea when you can clearly articulate yes. an end state Yes. And of course, we can't do that because of the rapid technological development, because of the emergent properties of, of the future, but also because I believe that the future will be that rapidly, constantly evolving, that instead of the future being a state, yeah. I think we have to realize that the future will be a process. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. So, yes. so, so our, our idea about the future is not about a future state. Yes. It is about, it's not about supporting the emergence of a future state. It's, a, it's supporting the emergence of a good future evolutionary process. Exactly. Where we, exactly. Where we become self-conscious about the importance of integrating the inner personal development and actively integrating the co-creation, the emergent co-creation of our collective imaginary as well. I think that's excellent. I, yeah, I, yeah, I've been, yeah I, I, I think that's a very important thing. I have a convergent argument about we have to give a, a, a kind of 
uh, teleology, a kind of theological thinking in which we're trying to get to the, the end state, the completion, the perfection. Yeah. You've got to yeah. give up though, those ways of understanding how we're going to move into the future. I, I, I think that's a very, very mm. deep and important thing you just said, Thomas. Yeah, but it's difficult because yeah. again, as you mentioned many times in your series, um, our, our human mind is uh, not made for, for these things. I mean, we, <laughs> we, we, we want to see the simple solution. We want to see a picture of where we are going. We want yeah. to know what is right and what is wrong. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it puts a huge demand on uh, not, not only the thought leaders of societies and the philosophers, but also really on every person in society yeah. that, yeah. that, that yeah. should be part of the yeah. democratic process right. of the society uh, uh, about. Yeah. So um, education and uh, our, our support, the society support for, for everyone to be able to develop the inner capacities to be part of this. I think that is super important if we are not going to end up with a two-tier society or yeah. something like that. Well, you've been an example. I mean, you're, you're not just talking, and everybody should know this. You know, Thomas is out there trying to actually, you know, put into, in, into existence all these things that he's talking about. Uh, you should know that, you know, and he, 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 in, in, a, in a sense, you're running a lot of the case studies that need to be run right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, no, I, th I think that that's what we need to do now. We, we, yeah. we need to prototype. Yeah, exactly. we, need to we need to experiment and we need to yeah. prototype. I mean, what, what, what is it like to be, be uh, creating a, a, a co-living space, for example, where, where you try to create a culture that is a deliberately developmental culture, a right. culture that is actually holding everyone's development and trying to bring out the best in every person. How do you create such a culture on a small scale? How do you experiment with these things? So it's, it's funny. It's funny to, to, to work with these things. Well, this has been really, really great, Thomas. I mean, I'm glad that, that you know, um, uh, uh, you, you were able to, uh, well, I'm grateful that you were here and you, you, so, you, know, you were able to articulate your vision and your, uh, so much, because I want more people uh, to be aware of your work and what you're thinking and, uh, and also, as I just mentioned, what you're doing and, and what's happening. Uh, uh, and so um, I wanted to ask you if there's any sort of final summative, uh, not to bring things to completion, <laughs> but is there, is there any final summative thing you want to say? Uh, no, I, I, I think it's important that we, we try to stay open yes. in, in uh, in rapid change and uh, when we have a uh, virus or war, it's very easy to, uh, to want to shut down, yeah. to go back. Yes, yes. Shut yeah. down, go back. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we know that there is no, uh, no going back. There is a lot to learn from history. There is a continuing, continu continuity. There is a continuum that we, we, we shouldn't, we, we should realize the importance of our, roots and the more well we know our roots the more rooted we are the more free we are to uh, explore and uh, experiment and and to dare those leaps of faith both the individual leaps of faith but also the collective ones that we are now uh, facing wow, that's excellent so um thank you again thomas uh, I thank you john to take a look at uh, thomas's uh, the books, uh, the two I held up, and the, and the, and the first one you mentioned, uh, the, uh, is it the market myth or the myth of the market? Myth? The, the market myth, yeah. And also, Thomas has some uh, uh, some YouTube videos that are out there uh, that uh, maybe Thomas, you can send me uh, some links for things I can put on, into the notes for this video, so people can uh, get more in, in contact with uh, with your work. Uh, so I, I will do that, John. Okay, so thank you very much. So th uh, thank you for. Uh, very nice conversation. Oh, it was, it was excellent. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk again.